The conversation featured in this video was recorded a few weeks before Judy Human passed away on March 4th, 2023. This is one of the five final episodes of The Human Perspective that will be released over the next few weeks. So welcome back to The Human Perspective. And today we're going to be talking to Molly Burke. Molly, who I'm sure many of you follow, is a huge YouTuber. But I have to say that we're both fangirling. She to me, me to her. You know, I have I read your book a couple of years ago. I have been rereading it and listening to your YouTube and uh, really admiring you in many, many different ways, which we'll get into talking about. But um, I want to start off by wishing you a happy birthday. And if the whole crowd could be singing happy birthday to you now, now that you're 29 years old, next year, you're going to be 30. What do you think about becoming 30? It's so weird because we spend half of our lives up until now wanting to be older. And then all of a sudden there's a switch and we want to hold on to our youth. So it's like this weird conflicting part of me where I'm like, I love getting older. Every year that I get older, life actually gets better. I feel more confident in myself, more comfortable in my own skin. I feel more self-assured and like I have a sense of direction and purpose that I know who I am. And then the other half is like, but youth, uh, you know, so it's a bit of both. But I, you know, 13 Going on 30 is one of the most iconic movies from my childhood. So I am, I think, ready to be 30, flirty and thriving when the time comes. I love that. Um, I want to also say that I really admire your clothing. So could you like let us know, do you have a stylist? How do you get your clothing? What do you like? What don't you like? I love fashion. I always have. I think it just runs in my genes. Both my parents love fashion. My grandma on my mom's side was a wedding dress designer and handmade dresses her whole life. So for me, I think it's just it's just in my blood as a little girl would I had a whole book of drawings of outfits that I was creating in my mind. And so for me, you know, when I lost the majority of my vision at 14, I always say it doesn't change who I am. It just changes how I have to do things. And of course, fashion is something that most people view as very visual. But for me at this point, it's not. Uh, I love color, even though I can't see it. I love wearing tons of color. I call it dopamine dressing because it makes me happy to wear so much color. Um, but for me, I, I feel all the fabrics and the shape, the construction, the material. Uh, and then I kind of have somebody do the visual part for me, picking the size, um, telling me what color or pattern it is. And then I kind of, with sighted people that I trust, put together outfits. For me, one of the issues around clothing like you said, is the texture. And one of the reasons why I don't like buying clothing online is you can't feel the texture. Um, are you doing a lot of your shopping online? And if so, how are you feeling the textures? No, I'm a big in-store person. I love going into store and feeling things. And every time people talk about like malls, the mall culture is ending and we're going to just online. That's the future. I'm like, no, please, no, because texture is so important. That's the only way you can really tell the quality of the garment, the material. Some feel itchy on the skin and some feel suffocating and some feel sweaty. And like, it's just so important to feel materials so you know you're going to be comfortable because to me, like comfort is absolute key with every outfit I wear yeah and exactly as you said it's it goes beyond the texture it when you talk about comfort so for me comfort sitting in the wheelchair is very important whether the pants slip and how it's going to fit around the side and back of my wheelchair and you can't really determine those things online you really have to be able to uh, try them on fit them, et cetera. And I think for you, for me, for many who have disabilities, this issue of how we stay in charge as much as possible in yes. what's happening to me. So for those people who follow Molly, and if you haven't, I really encourage you to go and we'll have links because I've been very impressed, Molly, with the... Um, the depth of your willingness to 
share very personal parts of your life. You let people in to your life in a way that I was talking to Kylie, very difficult. Um, so I'd like to know more about when did you decide that that was important and has over the years, have you found yourself being more analytical about some of these issues and wanting to share more with people as an example to get other people to get in touch with their own lives? You know, I think by nature, I'm an oversharer. It's just who I am. I kind of just, if it comes to my mind, I want to tell people about it. And that is to a fault sometimes, I do admit. Um, but I've come to realize over so many years of, of sharing my life, whether it be online or, or before that in the media or in public speaking engagements, I've realized the vulnerability is truly the key to unlocking bridging the gaps in society. We for so many generations were taught to like shove all of our secrets deep down inside. And that led to so much isolation and depression and anxiety. And, you know, I've struggled with mental illness my whole life. And I feel like by being just open and honest about, about every, every part of what makes me who I am, it allows other people to feel seen, to feel heard, to feel understood, less alone. And those are feelings that I have felt so many times in my life. So if by being open myself, I can help other people avoid those feelings, then, then my pain that I've been through has purpose and has meaning. And I want to live a life of meaning. What kinds of comments do you hear from your listeners? You know, of course, sharing my life with the with the world means I get the good, the bad, and the ugly. Sure. But for me, I, I do it for the good. I try my best as hard as it can be at times to block out the negative people because that just means my content isn't for you. And that's okay because there's people who it is for. And those people, I know through so many hundreds and thousands of comments over the years that that I have been able to save people's lives, that I have been able to empower people, to help them get their life back, their confidence, to feel like they can go to therapy, to, to feel like they can delve into their passions, that they can be more authentic and true to who they are. Uh, and I, I recently had somebody ask me like, oh, are, are you willing to change who you are to appease the people who don't like you? And I thought that was such a, a ridiculous question to ask me because number one, I've built a successful career for myself despite the haters. So I really don't think they matter. Um, and number two, I've built a platform on reminding everybody that life is so much more joyful when you are authentic and true to who you are. So I am never going to go change myself to make anybody else happy. I'd rather be happy than make other people happy. And I think you really exhibit that um, in the way you present yourself, your authenticity over time, because it is who you are and you've been doing this for more and more years now. I think people can see in you themselves um, and the fact that life is a progression. And, you know, in one of your, I think, more recent um, programs, you talk about how when things are bad, they will turn around and like riding things through. And I think, you know, for me, as I thought about that, it's very true. And it's also very hard sometimes to be able to con continue to ride the wave. But talking about it the way you do, I think also enables other people to uh, resonate to stories in their own lives. And to think about the past, where they are, and how things ebb and flow. One aspect um, of learning more about you over the years has been the degree of bullying that you've experienced. Certainly, bullying is something that doesn't surprise me. Yes. But your ability to really discuss it, again, in such depth. Um, 
maybe you could talk a little bit about how you have been able to move beyond the hurt of the bullying and whether or not you're working with any groups uh, on anti-bullying. You know, it, it's it's funny that you say that it doesn't surprise you because the only people who it doesn't surprise are people involved in the disability community. Non-disabled people all the time when I say that I was bullied are like, oh, a disabled person was bullied? And I'm like, well, what? Hello? Like, yeah, like, of course. Society constantly bullies disabled people by not giving us access, by not giving us representation, by discriminating against us. Like, yeah. Of course, when when kids are looking for a target, they look for the vulnerable. They look for the person who is obviously different. And unfortunately, so often that is those of us who are disabled. Um, and it just is another way in which I think society has put on the blinders to the injustices that disabled people face from such a young age. Um, and so I, I was bullied throughout school. I moved schools five times, um, both in the hopes to kind of get away from the bullying, as well as to find better accommodations. So it was kind of constantly this game of switching schools to find what school had the best supports for me as a blind student, as my vision was progressively getting worse, um, which schools had better social groups. And it, it was a definitely a challenge for me the whole way through school. And you know, it's it, kind of what I was just talking about. I, I would rather be happy in myself than live to make other people happy. And that's kind of the point that I got to after moving school so many times and, and being bullied at some worse than others, I kind of realized I am spending so much of my energy trying to fit in. I'm listening to the music that the cool kids listen to. I'm dressing in the clothes that the cool kids dress in. I'm trying to be the cool version of myself in the hopes that they will somehow ex finally accept me. And I was like, it's not working. I, I'm still being bullied or at the very least I don't have friends. Um, and I don't even like who I am because I'm not being true to myself. I'm listening to music I don't actually like. I'm dressing in clothes I don't think are cool, even if it's what society thinks are cool. So I might as well just kiss that dream goodbye listen to the music I want to listen to, wear the clothes I want to listen to, uh, I want to wear that I feel confident in, regardless of how cool they are to others. And when I did that, you know, I was not only so much happier in myself, because I was being true to the to the inside of me, and reflecting it externally, but also people did see me then for who I was. And I did make more authentic connections with people um, because I was finally meeting people who maybe weren't the cool kids, but like who saw themselves in me because they're like, oh, I like that kind of style. I like that kind of music. Um, and I got to a point in, in my later years of school, you know, grade 11 and 12, where I, I literally would have kids like throw garbage at me when I would walk by. Um, kids who didn't know me, we had no classes, they had never talked to me. It was just for fun. Or they'd stick their leg out when they were sitting down in the hopes of like tripping the blind girl as she walked down the hallway. And I just got to the point where it no longer hurt me because I had done so much internal self-work and development on learning to love and accept myself and learning to feel confident and believe in myself that I had purpose and I had a direction in life and I was gonna go somewhere. And I got to this point where I was like, school is not my life. This is a stepping stone that I've got to step on to get to the rest of my life that's gonna be so much better than this. And so by grade 12, I didn't, I didn't get a high school graduation photo. I didn't go get a yearbook. I didn't even show up to my graduation. My parents just picked up my graduation certificate from the office like six months after graduating when they were like, can you come get her certificate? Um, I was just like, this doesn't matter. In the grand scheme of life, this doesn't matter. It ends when I'm 18 and I have so much life to live after this. So I'm not gonna let these people hold so much emotional weight and place in my journey 
when I'm going to go on to do so much more than this will ever give me. And, and that's just how I coped. That's how I was able to get through those kind of final years without damaging my own self more. Um, and it was the best gift I gave myself. What was really shocking to me was how the school administration seemed to be doing nothing about this. And we know that bullying, wherever it's going on, is something which is seen by adults. Mm -hmm. And adults not dealing with it um, is, I think, not only harmful to the people who are being bullied, but really to the perpetrators also, because all these people are not taking action when kids are doing something that if they continue to do over the course of their lives will not bode well for them. So it's really a failure. Um, one of the examples that you gave, which to me was painful, uh, if I remember it correctly, you were in a class in one of your five schools. And uh, I guess at some point you used to have a one-on-one. -on -one. And in this particular school, they said you couldn't have the one-on-one. -on -one. And so there was a young girl who was helping you. And then you learned later on that she was basically being bribed by the teacher to help you. How old were you when that was going on? I was just eight years old. And if you can imagine how damaging to a young eight-year-old self-esteem that experience was, I felt that I had a friend, you know, and, and she was one of the smart kids in class and she was beautiful and she had friends and I, and I felt like she was my friend. Um, and then to kind of find out that essentially the teacher was literally giving her gifts to help me. I think she got a stuffed animal and I think her family got like basketball tickets and like my, I was so gutted at just eight years old to think like that a teacher was bribing another student to help the disabled girl in class. Um, and, and I, I personally believe that that teacher didn't want my one-on-one -on -one in her class because she wanted her ill behavior as a teacher to go unchecked. You know, she wanted to be able to do things like that um, and not have other adults able to kind of hold her accountable. Um, but yeah, it was at such a young age, like su such a gut punch. Do you ever do presentations in schools? Yeah, a, a lot of my, my early career when I was young was speaking to middle school, high school and universities, um, a lot about bullying and mental health. Um, I started doing it part time in, in high school and then went full time at 18. And so I can remember when I was in school, these kind of 40, 50 year olds would come in and talk about bullying. I was like, well, this doesn't feel related. You, you didn't even have social media when you were in school. You don't know what we are going through. But when I went in there and I, I looked very young for my age at the time, especially, and I looked like I was one of them still, you know, and 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 they believed me because I was just in their shoes, you know? And I, I think it was so powerful, especially at a young age to be able to go in and speak to other youth. Do you hear from youth or others about how your message is impacting them? All the time, we get so many messages and they just, like I said, they give they give all that pain that I went through a purpose. They give me this drive, this meaning. And and I really believe that whatever higher power is out there, like sent me down for a reason to to be the person that I am um, and to be able to to have the ability to to share these things with people, because I know not everybody is able to do that is able to tap into that vulnerability or put themselves out there for, for the world to, to talk about, um, cause it, it isn't easy. Um, but I do it for the people who, who don't or can't find their voice to do it. Did you have role models when you were growing up of, um, disabled or non-disabled people? 
You know, I, I really struggled to find a person um, in in kind of the media that I felt I resonated with. Mm -hmm. um, I, I loved Lindsay Lohan when I was really young because people said I looked like her and I wanted to be an actress. And then I loved Hilary Duff because she was kind of like the goody goody two shoes girl. And that's kind of how I thought of myself. And then as I got a little older, I loved Demi Lovato because she was one of the first people who was outspoken about mental health and and bullying. But I, I, I never could find somebody disabled, somebody who I felt was truly like me um, because a lot of the times I was, I was served, you know, um, Paralympians and, and that's fantastic, but I'm the beauty fashion media wanted to be an actress and a model and a singer girl. So for me, um, seeing these athletes, it didn't really resonate with me. And that's kind of a part of why I wanted to do what I do. And of course I can never dream of representing a community. I can't bear that weight. I'm just one single person with one single story. But I hope to represent the people who see themselves in me, which again is not going to be everyone. But I know that I've had so many young girls in particular reach out who, who are disabled and they love fashion and makeup and they want to work in the entertainment industry and, and they do see themselves in me. And I, I feel so lucky to get to be the person for these young girls that I never felt that I had when I needed it. Right. I mean, I think things have gotten a little bit better, but exactly as you're saying, it is still in many ways shocking that there are not the number of disabled people being highlighted um, around the country so that young people and older people can look to others um, who have disabilities. What I like very much about your presentations is you bring your whole self and you, like everybody else, we're complex. There are many different parts about ourselves. Um, your birthday YouTube was great with the presents that you were getting and then the one that you're discussing, your five disability areas of vulnerability. It's really um, very upbeat and then very emotional uh, pieces, I think are an, a great example for um, what I want to be able to encourage other people to do is to realize that authenticity in our stories is is very important. And um, to see that we're well-rounded people um, who experience life like other people. What do you see in your future? Because you, you, are you getting into acting? What other forms of media are you exploring? You know, I've been very fortunate in my career to get to do some commercial modeling, which certainly kind of check that box of that childhood dream, being able to be on a big commercial set. And um, I've, I've always had a lot of fun doing that. Um, but I, I love the work that I do, being able to be my own boss and not wait for other people to hand me an opportunity and see the value of me, but being able to do it for myself um, is so rewarding through my social media. Um, I'm also launching a podcast later this year. So hopefully I can have you on my podcast. That would be amazing. Um, and just hoping to to be able to, through my podcast, you know, uplift more people and, and empower them to share their voice and their story and their message with the world. Because I've been so fortunate to build a successful platform for myself that I could have never foreseen being what it is today. And, and I want to just be able to help uplift more people to be able to do the same, um, especially those in our community, because unfortunately we know, especially in media, um, we're not often given opportunities. And so often the few roles that do exist for us end up going to non-disabled actors, um, which is a whole other issue, a whole other topic that I could rant on for a very long time. Um, but, you know, I hope to just keep being able to empower myself, my community and, and share and uplift others as well. 
I think it's very much a part of this discussion, actually, um, because we look at groups like Forward Doc, which is an organization that started in the last few years made up of disabled individuals in documentary filmmaking and another new organization over the last few years called Ramped, which is uh, focusing on disabled people in music and the music industry. So the good thing about those organizations for me is that um, A, there are more people who are in the industry and trying to break into the industry and by coming together, uh, they are able to realize that they're not alone. I mean, I think that's one thing which is so very important. Again, getting back to what you speak about when you speak as sincerely as you do. Um, in many ways, what you're experiencing is something that many people experience. But being able to share that as I've been saying, it's really important. And I think when we look at groups like Forward Doc and like Ramped, it's really bringing disabled people together and others in the profession to realize that they need to be inclusive of disabled people. They need to listen to stories. The impact that you've had in the industry, how would you define that? You know, it, it's, I think I'm my own worst critic, like a lot of people are, especially being a, a rather artistic person. I, I'm, I'm a deep thinker and I'm, I'm sensitive and I, uh, you know, I'm my, I'm my own harshest critic. I, I never feel like I've accomplished enough or I'm doing enough or what I do is good enough. And I, I try so hard to work on that every day. Um, and that's why when I receive all these sweet messages from people, it means so much to me because it is hard for me to take credit. I think the reality is there's so much I still feel needs to be done for our community. And I think that I will die feeling like there is still so much to be done because even though we've come so far in the 29 years that I've been alive and you've seen even more progress than I have, I'm sure you can agree there's still so much you know, and and when you dedicate your life to trying to build these inroads and and trying to make any little bit of an impact that you can for our community, it's hard to see that when you're still so focused on the greater picture of what still has to happen, you know? So I'd like to think I've, I've made an impact, but really what I mostly focus on is how much more I still want to do. So in one of the um, more recent presentations that you um, made, you were talking about how you miss out on facial expressions and body language. So I just want to say, in relationship to what we're discussing, I'm nodding my head and um, I'm very emotional right now with what you're saying because you're 30, I'm 75. And I remember being 30. Oh my God, when I became 30. But at any rate, um, I speak so much the way you are, which is we have so much more to go. And one of the issues I'm always talking about is why is it taking so long to get such basic things addressed? You know, the reality is, from my perspective, that discrimination has existed for so long and people may not want to use that word, but the reality is being cut out of society, trying to fight our way back into society, um, bullying, being an example of the hate that people get away with. I mean, your stories and other people's stories talk about the consistency of bullying, which is something that society is quietly or not so quietly accepting. So our being an example and encouraging other people to speak up and out about how it is imperative that disability be 
a mainstream subject so that we're seeing, I don't mean literally seeing, but that we are learning um, about people with all types of disabilities and the impact that disability plus gender, plus race, plus religion, plus, plus, plus the complexities. So I am sure that when you're however old you're gonna be before you leave this planet, you will continue to make meaningful changes. And I would like to be able to believe that we're gonna be incrementally making changes more rapidly. And we can see it a little bit, but nonetheless, when we talk about 64 million disabled people in the US, if 10 to 20 million of us were really on this page, things would be changing more rapidly. I wanna change the discussion a little bit. How did you pick the logo of the dog and the cat running around? You know, I, I have a guide dog uh, and I've been a guide dog user for going on 16 years, which I can't believe. Um, so that's just a huge part of, of my identity. I really feel like I've, I, you know, I've had a guide dog since 13. It really is an extension of who I am. Um, so I had to include my dog and I have a cat, my pet cat. Her name is Lavender. And I think having a pet is just as important as having my mobility aid included. So yeah, my guide dog and my cat are such a huge piece of me. You know, they're, they're like my children. How many dogs have you had? Is this your second or third? My fourth. Oh, your fourth. I'm on my fourth guide dog. Yeah. Yeah. I had um my first for seven years and unfortunately she passed away before retiring um, and then I had my second for seven years, and he is a happy retired guide dog who's a pet now at home with Lavender. Uh, and then, unfortunately, my third only worked for eight months before developing an issue, and uh, now I'm on my fourth. What's your fourth's name? Elton John. Oh, that's right. Yes. I love it. Have you ever it's met like Elton John? I would love to. I've always loved Elton John's music, and I've loved it even more now that I got my my El very own Elton John. And it's funny because the dog I had before him for only eight months um, uh, was named Ben, Ben Ben. And I used to sing from the moment I got him, Benny and the Jets. So when they gave me Elton John, it kind of felt like the universe was telling me this, this is the right path, you know? Okay. I'm going to remind you that I'm 75. What is Benny or who is Benny and the Jets? Benny and the Jets. <laughs> That's an iconic Elton John song. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Kylie and I have been discussing names of people. Uh, Bert Backrack, who passed away yesterday, and Kylie didn't know who Bert Backrack was. So there are these generational issues, yes. and I'm a little embarrassed sometimes by it, but I have to ask. So what are some of the messages that you want to give to parents who have disabled children? Wow, there's so many. And I'm so fortunate that many, many of my followers are parents of disabled children. And it makes me so happy because many disabled children, most, grow up with non-disabled parents. And unfortunately, that often means that the systemic ableism that's in society gets passed down. And I think so many disabled people are trapped inside their own ableist beliefs and, and dealing with internalized ableism simply because they've been raised in an ableist society. And so I'm so happy that so many parents come to my channel and watch my content and can hopefully unlearn on time to not pass those beliefs down to their children. Um, and so for me, the, the biggest thing would be learn from disabled people. And there are so many, I am just one of many disabled creators on TikTok and on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. There are so many people with all different types of disabilities and chronic illnesses, sharing their story, sharing their journey, educating in an entertaining and fun way and there's no excuse not to take the time to learn about your child's community 
and to be able to engross your child in that community. And that's certainly the best thing my parents did for me upon diagnosis was immediately get me involved in sports for the blind, camps for the blind, going to conferences um, for disabled youth and, and all of these things because it meant for me that it, it was normal, but for so many people, uh, they don't grow up around disabled people. And I know that because I get those comments every day too. You know, I, I always remind my followers, I have many disabled followers who have been disabled from birth or who have been disabled for many, many years. And sometimes what I talk about or what I share might seem simple to them or basic, but I have to remind everybody that for some people, I am the first thing they find when they go home from a diagnosis and they start Googling. I might be one of the first resources they come to in their journey. And so sometimes my content is a little more simple. I, you know, I make it more basic or simple or digestible or, or try to make it a bit more entertaining and fun than you want, might expect because I want, I want people who are fresh to their diagnosis or new to this experience in this community to feel that it's approachable, to not feel so scared, to feel comforted and safe and like there's hope, you know, because there is. Um, and so I, I really just hope for, for parents of disabled children that they, they themselves can unlearn the ableist beliefs that society has held for way too long and that they can, you know, help their child, whether it's in real life or virtually find their community because it is so important as, as a disabled person to have community. Have you ever done anything with your mother? Oh, yes. My mom is is well known by the channel. My mom is my best friend and um, she is my business partner. She is is so much to me. I think I'm I'm so fortunate to have had the parents that I do. My mom and dad, you know, always empowered me and uplifted me and really encouraged me to focus on all of the things that I could do and to not let myself feel bad about the things that I could not. Um, and they they never made me feel that my strengths and weaknesses were, were related to me being disabled and simply were related to me being a human. And all humans have strengths and weaknesses, and that's okay. Um, and so I, I'm so lucky. Yeah, my parents played a very important role in my life. And I think when we talk to many disabled people and others, um, people speak about the role of their parents. Yes. And for me, one thing I like to tell parents is, you're really a role model for your children. And so pushing forward when things are difficult is an important thing to be able to do because it helps your children as they're growing up also learn that that's something that we have to do in life, that we can't be accepting no's as frequently as they may well come about. Um, we have to turn them into yeses. And I think it is difficult for some parents to be able to look at, well, how to move forward because there may be a lot of challenges going on in their families already. And then depending on the type of disability that the child or adult may have. So I agree with you that programs like ours really are enabling people to get more information. And it's unfortunate, I think, that acquiring disabilities still can be a shock to people because they don't see us, they don't learn about us, they look at disability as a tragedy, as opposed to being able to learn about what is possible to do and how to move forward. So Absolutely. I think- I, I always find one of the most shocking comments that I, I still get is, I'd rather die than be blind. Or if I went blind, I'd kill myself. You know, when I lost the majority of my vision, I did fall into a deep depression and I did have suicidal ideation. But I realize now it's not because of my blindness. It's because of 
society. It's because of how society made me feel, how society treated me, the lack of access and opportunity that I felt I now had. And at the end of the day, when you're handed a situation, whatever it is, whether it's disability or any other number of challenges, when you're handed a challenge in life, which is ultimately inevitable, it's going to continue to happen again and again, you just find the strength. You just do because you don't have a choice. And I'm so lucky to have had parents who advocated for me when I couldn't and who taught me how to advocate for myself. I think what I really hope my, my content accomplishes is normalizing disability because we've been so othered from society for so long that you're right, it is shocking to people when they or a loved one becomes disabled because not us. No, right. we're not those people. They're other. That's a totally separate type of human to the rest of us, right? And for so many generations, if you saw a disabled person from, from a young child, you were taught, don't look, don't point, don't stare, don't ask questions, don't talk to them. Ignore it. Ignore disability. And we have been ignored for far too long, and we're done being ignored. We're here. We're not going anywhere. And you're more likely to join us than we are to join you. <laughs> exactly. And so we might as well accept that we're here and embrace the community. For so long, people just looked at us purely for our disability. Oh, you're in a wheelchair. That's what you are. You are blind. That's what you are. You're an amputee. That's what you are. You're cognitively delayed. That's what you are. And that was it. They stopped seeing a human beyond that disability and I think the reason my content has been successful is because I'm like, yeah, okay, that exists. But also like, I love fashion and I go on horrible Tinder dates and let's talk about how much I love Ed Sheeran and sushi and how cute is my dog? Let's go to yoga class. <laughs> and all of a sudden people are like, oh, wait, whoa, I'm kind of like her. Like, I also love a lot of those things, huh? And they start to see the human and that's why to me the you know the videos like the five things i miss out on as a blind person are just as important as important as my birthday vlog how i spent my birthday because i want people to see how i as a disabled person have a totally normal birthday i celebrate with my friends and they bring gifts and we have cake and we sing and you know i do normal human things and if I am a normal human who is also disabled, then maybe that person in a wheelchair who applied for the job, or maybe that boy in your class who's missing his left arm or who has a facial difference is also more normal than you've been giving them credit for. And maybe you should start the conversation. Maybe you should give them an opportunity or a chance and you'll see that yes, the disability exists, but we are so much more beyond that. And how it's a real strength. Absolutely, absolutely. So we're coming to an end, unfortunately, but I have one other question. And that is, what are some practices other people can engage in so that social media is more accessible to you and other people who are blind and low vision or have other forms of disabilities? Great question. Of course, always making sure you have your captions turned on. Uh, this isn't something that I specifically as a blind person benefit from, but obviously I have to mention it. Super important for deaf of heart and hard of hearing. It's super important for people who have maybe cognitive delays, learning disabilities, language impairments, all of those. So really important. And I suggest getting a better service um, for your captions. Most Sites nowadays have auto captions, but they're usually not good enough. Um, I personally use Rev.com for my YouTube videos, but there's many apps and programs out there where you can customize the captions to make sure that they are actually accurate. Um, I would recommend using bold fonts and high color contrasts anytime you are doing like an image with wording on it, uh, making sure the background isn't too busy. That way, low vision people can clearly read what's happening on the screen uh, and making sure the words aren't moving too quickly. If it's a moving image with writing, 
Uh, I would always recommend that if you're doing a video with writing on the screen, you know, those, those videos, they're emotional. There's just music and words, always having a voiceover that is also reading the words along with uh, what's written. Again, this is not only helpful for people like me who are blind, but it's also often helpful for people, English as a second language, for people who have language processing disorders, um, always using alt text, which is embedding an image description into images on your website, on your app, uh, on your uh, Instagram, t uh, Twitter, any of that, uh, or simply writing your photo description in your caption. Uh, so those are some that come to mind. Oh, camel case hashtags. That's where when you do the hashtag, if it's a multi-word hashtag, you are capitalizing the first letter of every word. Again, this is so screen readers can actually read each word out as opposed to reading it as one long word, um, but also good for people uh, who struggle with word differentiating. So those are some that come to mind right off the bat. Why is Braille important? Oh, I love Braille. And unfortunately, so many blind people nowadays aren't being taught Braille because technology is so wonderful. Uh, and, and yes, technology is great, but it does not teach you phonetics. It does not teach you grammar. Um, I can't hear a comma. I can't hear a period or an exclamation mark. Unfortunately, the English language isn't phonetic. Many words have secret hidden H's and T's and G's, and you can't hear that when you're only ever hearing words read aloud to you. So to me, um, for a blind person, it's really important to read Braille simply for grammar and spelling. Um, but also, I think it's such a rich part of our, our history and our culture as a, as a community. And it is something that despite the fact that I have technology, I still to this day use it every single day. Because believe me, it's a hell of a lot quicker to read the numbers on the elevator in Braille or read the bathroom sign in Braille than it is to whip out my phone, open an app, scan all the things, make sure. <laughs> I, no, Braille is just quicker in those situations. So for many reasons, I believe Braille is so important. And I highly encourage parents and teachers of blind youth to still teach them Braille. Molly Burke, this has been such an amazing pleasure. And uh, we will stay in touch. Absolutely. And I know that some of our audience is already aware of who you are. And I hope more people will now be drawn to your work. And I very much look forward to continue to work with you. Absolutely. It's been such an honor and a privilege to speak with you. I admire the work you've done so much. You're such an inspiration to me and so many other young disabled people. So thank you for paving the way for me to do what I do. Thank you very much. Or such a minimize our pain.